Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode eight of Masks and Mimicry. Today, as usual, it's Brand and I, and we're going to talk about metagaming, specifically yes. dealing with metagaming as a storyteller in whatever tabletop game you may be in. Uh, yeah. Metagaming is <clears throat> a universal thing. <clears throat> Sorry, is you is pretty universal. It's more of a problem in some games than others, I think. Um, but it certainly comes up in all of them. So, uh, one thing I did want to do to start us off to ask for everyone in chat, but also for you and I, of course, is whether or not you've ever faced a real problem with someone metagaming. Not just, you know, them doing it, but someone, an instance where it was a real issue and problem in the game. Ooh. Uh... Uh, from a storyteller's perspective, no, uh, and I guess that comes down to being in you know our group that we have now. Yeah, um, you guys coming in already well, understanding of that possibility and how that works. That I never had to deal with that uh, as a storyteller. Yeah. Uh, that there might be occasionally one person in our group who falls into a, a, the occasional moment of doing it. I, I think we all kind of maybe even do that ourselves from time to time but largely not an issue in our group yeah i've never really had an issue with like a serious issue with metagaming in any of my games that i could think of and you know i thought of it i, I was thinking on this for a while trying to come up with a really good instance and uh it's certainly been an issue but never something where like we really you know it was causing serious problems in the game itself uh, i have we have had an issue before, uh, not in tabletop, but in MMORPG role playing, um, where metagaming kind of caused a problem, but it wasn't really the metagaming itself, but more someone else's behavior that uh, caused the issue. <laughs> um, and and so that's that's kind of related, but not not really the same. Uh, kind of like was, the response to the metagaming, if you will. Well, it was it was more that one person. Uh, I mean, it kind of does fall a little bit in the metagame because one person was basically having their character spy on other people, um, by just walking around and following them and hanging out and not really role playing with them, just having their character around them and like literally hiding where they couldn't see them and stuff. It was very stalkerish. It was very creepy. And I, so <laughs> on the one hand, it's kind of metagame because they weren't like informing the people that they were there. And I'm like, that's not quite okay. <laughs> uh, even in a, vir even a virtual setting, that's not, that's not okay with me that they don't know you're there watching them RP. That's kind of creepy. Um, uh, you were not there for that, but we did have to deal with it in our guild. So, uh, mm. you know, if I, I can I, only I imagine. Up, I won't bring who. up the L word of who. Yeah, we're that's that's who. To. That's yeah, the you who. know who I'm referring to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, but then also on a certain aspect, the people dealing with it were kind of metagaming because they knew the person was there because they found out out of RP, and then they were like, "Wait a minute, what? No, this is not cool," and they started this whole issue, and um, that definitely required an action but it was a, that was a very convoluted and yeah very specific version unusual yeah <laughs> not something you, you don't, don't often deal with, deal with that um certainly not as a storyteller yeah, yeah i guess the, the only way you could have to deal with that is in a tabletop game is if you were trying to keep something secret like you know having whispers or something and someone was like deliberately trying to eavesdrop uh, yeah that would be also problematic <laughs> Uh, and kind of similar, but so uh, how about for chat? Either of you had any um, any problems like that that really rose to a level where like an intervention had to be had? Um, so while we're while they're talking about that, uh, potentially, I did want to move into what is metagaming in the first place? Yeah, because what is uh, it? What even is it? What even is it? Uh, if, if I could be so yeah. so bold and broad with it, uh, uh, it, it covers a lot of things, but yeah. broadly speaking, it is a player like you or, or me um, using information that we have sitting at the table 
um, to cause our characters that we control to do things that the characters would not be able to fully make a conscious choice to do those things. We're using the information we know, the knowledge we have to allow our characters to respond to it when they shouldn't. Yeah. And I would say, uh, I would, I would maybe broaden that a little bit to say any sort of out of in character influence affecting in character decisions. So any sort of influence that is not, internal to your character from something they know or something that they would do uh, influencing their behavior. And that can include out of character suggestions like other players going, Hey, do this out yeah. of character <laughs> um, to uh, <laughs> you know, knowing about private activities that someone else has done, that someone else's character has done elsewhere when your character wasn't even there. Right. And somehow your character knows uh, what went on. Um, I do feel like I said earlier, that let's see, Sarah was saying there have been some people she's played with that felt the need to say this is out of character. Um, yeah, it's it's sometimes hard to have to make that distinction at times, especially mm-hmm. since a lot of us play virtually now, sometimes with out cameras or anything, and it could be or a little. Yeah, not using voices or anything like it. your your normal voice is your character voice, and it's hard to differentiate. I do know a lot of groups maybe play the game versus play the role play or the or the story, and yeah. they do a lot of you know just mechanical uh, out of character strategy talking amongst each other, and, and that's okay if the whole group is if that's how they do it. But yeah, um, I do think it's a a bigger issue in some games, uh, like for instance, Vampire the Masquerade. It, it, Meta gaming can be a huge issue in that game. Because uh, sometimes your characters are not working together. Well, even though it's presumed you are in a group or in a coterie, it's not necessarily assumed that you're always working towards each other's favor or they're all each no. other's goals. Um, you don't always share goals. Sometimes you're working in opposition to each other. Um, and sometimes your character may not know that, but you may know that. And... Okay. Uh, because you know sometimes depending on the storyteller you may do things very privately you may segregate everything and kind of go like okay we're gonna have our conversation here but honestly i think a lot of the drama from some games like vampire comes out from people knowing some things out of character but not being able to do anything in character like knowing out of character that you are trying to do something that's going to screw them over but then in character Mm -hmm. they don't know that and so they're like they want to do something about it but they really can't yeah (laughs) Um, and you, I imagine you'd start getting into moments down the road rather than initially where you're thinking about, okay, you know, I, I can't react to that. And then as time is going on, just subconsciously, you are aware of that information and you start doing small things that react to it without you even thinking about it. Yeah. And there's some things you can't, you can't help all the time. Um, Grimslag is giving some examples here, passing written notes to the GM as a way to create tension uh, to other people viewing the interaction, I, I think can be fun, especially in certain games like, uh, again, you know, Vampire and other games where it's not presumed that you're all helping each other necessarily. Uh, getting a private communication from the storyteller can be tense for other people because uh, they see you go over there and they're like, "What are they talking about? I don't know. What right? Are they, what are they doing?" Um, <laughs> Crimson Lake would sometimes pass the GM a note, not. Asking that what we should do for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Just to throw people off. Mm-hmm. That is one thing you miss sometimes online. It's really easy to be discreet about things, but you miss the note passing. Uh, yeah. That's never been a huge aspect of my like tabletop game, my live tabletop games, but it is something that we've used every now and then, you know, on occasion we'll come in and somebody will pass some notes back and yeah. forth. And, um, it could be a fun thing to have an option to do and to do it where someone can see you do it. Yeah. It works really well as a player giving it to the DM. Uh, maybe a little less so when the DM hands a player a note because now everyone knows something was given. There's an aspect of metagaming there that they are aware something was handed over out of character mm-hmm. and they're all waiting to know what it is. And if you don't say anything, it's, it's going to start eating at them. Yeah, I can say <clears throat> a definite plus for playing online is combating metagaming when someone wants Mm -hmm. to be sneaky. 
even oh. even if they're not in opposition. For instance, just this past, just yesterday, or not yesterday, <laughs> Monday. It's Wednesday now. So just Monday, uh, your character in my game mm-hmm. decided to do something, some things that were rather sneaky uh, to annoy some of the other characters. And um, mm-hmm. specifically... <clears throat> <laughs> Uh, played some illus- illusory tricks on one of them. And because they didn't see you do anything, because we're virtual, you could just DM it to me privately and they never knew. Right. They had no idea. And they were just like, ah, oh, this is weird. I don't like it. What's going on? Meanwhile, right. if if we had been a live tabletop and you had had to pass me a note and then something mm-hmm. weird happened, they would have been like... Right. I, I really... <laughs> I enjoy that a lot with a character like the character I'm playing or any character like that who does it in, in any campaign to have that ability to allow the storyteller to integrate it rather seamlessly and unknowingly to create real atmosphere to an extent. Yeah. Now, out of a lot of these different types of metagaming, uh, a lot of these examples, are there any examples that y'all don't think is really a problem or at least usually isn't really a problem it's metagaming but it's okay uh uh it, yeah there are i could probably think of of some minor ones um well i think one is like the example you mentioned earlier of like people out of combat kind of giving some strategic tips and pointers and yeah stuff. and it kind of depends on the extent for me and the game but for like D D. If, if someone's like, oh, wait, well, I can do this, so you don't have to do that, and it's it's not something that happens, like, constantly, I'm, I usually let it slide. Like, I'm like, eh, hey, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think it's allowable. Um, maybe not in, you know, consecutively every on every turn everyone's doing yeah. that, but it, in moments where there's some confusion uh, and players certainly want to try to uh, balance things out a little bit between themselves, I think that's that's fine. Yeah. Um, and even to an extent, uh, n- just general knowledge of the, I wouldn't say the lore of the world you're playing in, but certain mm-hmm. aspects of it. Um, to some extent, there's some okay elements of like, hey, I probably know what this thing is. It's it's a fairly common, like in D&D, fairly common creatures. Do I know what a goblin is? Well, well yeah, it's a goblin. Yeah. You know? just, just some base understanding of assuming you know some things like that then with some more specific things allowing the the dm to tell you yes or no based off of a role or a question and sarah suggests uh players knowing who has what magic items um you know that can be uh it's not i mean at least i think usually in D &D, you know people tend to know because people are like they saw them get the magic item so they know they have it um but there are occasions where, yeah, you like know that somebody has something because your character may not know or see that they have it, but you do. Um, I do think that, in general, a lot of metagaming slips are expected because um, we're not perfect. Um, not, no, nobody's perfect when they're playing these games. And, you know, sometimes there's something like that, like, oh, yeah, why don't you use that thing you have? How do you know I have that thing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't. Oops. Do you have a thing that can do something like this? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's gonna happen on occasion. It's just like, uh, yeah. like the that's why like the combat suggestions and stuff. I don't like if it if it's happening a lot, but you know, if every now and then something's going on and someone's like, like, oh, oh, it, you you could do this, or hey, don't forget you have a thing that gives you advantage if you remember to use it. Don't forget I inspired you. You know people get excited and you know so there's sometimes you know things like that i'm okay with i'm like yeah okay reminding somebody that they've got inspiration i don't care about that i'm not gonna make a stink about it yeah Uh, and i think we go through that every week just about someone (laughs) and and i as a player you know want to make sure that the benefits i've given to everyone yeah that they remember that they have them because it could be important to them (laughs) and they've got a lot of other things to be thinking about yeah Um, Let's see. Again, man with no screen name. I suppose it also depends on how genre savvy or erudite the players are. One guy used to roll with chewed through a book a day, so the DM would have to do extra work not to make it boring for that guy. Uh, yeah, that is a 
that is a problem, especially in, in certain games like D&D, where if you're playing with more veteran players, we know most of the mobs. You know a lot uh, of them. I don't know yeah. them by heart, necessarily, but, you know, like, the the other week, uh, playing a Brands game, he whipped out a shadow, and I mm-hmm. was like, oh... I have no idea what this thing does. <laughs> and I was just like, hmm, I'm pretty sure it's immune to poison damage. I know it's immune to necrotic. Like, I'm, I'm like 99% sure It's actually sure not. That. Oh, really? Well, It's shit. not. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm like 99% sure it's immune to necrotic. So I'm going to hit it with poison. I'm still like 80% sure it's immune to poison. It's immune it it to was poison. indeed. Oh, yeah. well, I wasted a spell. All right, everyone, I'm useless in this fight. <laughs> but see, that's okay. Like, you knew it going into it, and you still cast the spell because yeah. the character technically didn't know. Yeah. Now, I did kind of metagame a little bit because I was like, I'm pretty sure it's immune to poison. Yeah. I'm I'm almost certain it's immune to necrotic. Just to be, just to be sure. So I'm going to cast <laughs> one of them. I'm going to go for the poison. Uh, yeah. And... I, I think I think my sometimes I get confused with additions because I'm pretty sure all undead used to be immune to necrotic and poison just straight across the board. Yeah, uh, so and in this case, me. like I'll I'll make flavorful changes. Um, if you recall, like the character Torin used divine sense a number of times, didn't sense anything, uh, because in this case I actually made them non undead. But. So I'll make some flavorful changes like that yeah. to prevent, yeah. and that kind of goes into ways to prevent some metagame is to like change things up just a little bit so it's not exactly what a player might yeah. suspect it is. Yeah, you're the storyteller, or in the case of D&D, you're the DM. <laughs> you can change whatever you want. So if you want to um, make a weird aberration, now fire elemental, you can do that. Uh, <laughs> if you want to... Uh, Make a uh, undead creature not technically undead. It's nothing to stop you. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's one of the reasons I like to make a lot of custom creatures too. Besides the fact that I get frustrated that the books just don't have things that I want. And then I'm like, ah, I want to do this. Um, but also just to, it, it helps to mix it up some for people that are familiar with the books. And... There are there have been the rare occasions where I have felt, and this is something that is frustrating with playing online. There have been the rare occasions where I've been like, "Is someone looking up this monster right now?" Like we're playing, and I've pulled this mm. out. Have they just pulled it up on D and D Beyond and look yeah. see what its stats are and everything? <laughs> Never to the point where I was like, I felt like I had to talk to somebody about it, like because I was sure they were doing it, but I was like, "Are they doing that?" I really hope not. <laughs> I do do that when I watch Critical Role just to see what it, hmm. like Matt Mercer is throwing yeah. at them. I was like, oh, this sounds cool. I kind of think I know what it is. Let's look it up. Okay, yeah, no, that that's that's exactly what it is. There, oh, this is this could go really bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so that that's a a very different and direct type of meta gaming, you know, like yeah. someone actually actively going and looking things up during a game. That's borderline um, cheating. It is. <laughs> but it's, it's also something that's extremely difficult to prove. I mean, yeah, you especially in a virtual unless setting. Admitted it. Unless someone admitted to doing it, you'd be like, I mean, how am I going to prove it? There's no way. Uh, and honestly, ultimately, you know, the playing of these tabletop games comes down to just trying to have fun anyway. Yeah. So even if somebody looks up a monster's stats, I mean, how how much use can they really get out of that? For most classes, not a lot. Um, if it's a if it's a caster, they can maybe get some good use out of it. But yeah, and if you're playing with someone like you or, or even me, going into things like changing things up, what you're looking at may not be the the actual reflection of what's happening. Maybe maybe there's more yeah. health. Maybe there's more AC. So the next thing I wanted to kind of delve into was preventative measures how do you bless you how do you preemptively prevent metagaming like how do you try to minimize that uh i think the first step comes with uh just that and we've talked about this in other uh episodes is is that pre-talk uh just Mm -hmm. that understanding of you know what to expect 
uh, as players in a DM, how are we as a group knowing who you're playing with and how the group functions and anyone who uh, you feel might pose a little bit of a, of a problem here, there to just hash it out. Like maybe they don't know what metagaming is. Maybe you have to introduce them to what it means and just, just make sure everyone yeah. understands, you know, don't do that. It's, it's typically frowned upon. Yeah. Set the expectations for the game. What yeah. do you expect to play? Cause, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, there are some people that play it more kind of to beat the game. They, they, they play mm-hmm. it to sort of play the system and the mechanics, and they they may be expecting um, it, and have in previous groups had a lot of those strategic talks out of character between each other and everything to figure out how to beat a fight and everything. Um, and so setting expectations, especially with a newer group or with some newer players, is important. Um that um and and then dealing with it instantly uh, if you whether you have the, that talk or or not when it comes up to deal with it at that moment to be like hey you don't know this you know that it's not something your character would know so you wouldn't necessarily be able to make that choice or you know it should just explain in the moment yeah. that that doesn't make sense and to explain why going forward try to be conscious about it for sure um i think that goes kind of hand in hand with one one of the things I want to suggest, which was you can prevent future metagaming by not rewarding current metagaming. Avoid yeah. rewarding whatever they're doing that's inappropriate. Um, and that can go into directly stopping them and saying, like, you, you wouldn't be able to do that or you wouldn't know to do that, so don't do that, blah, blah, blah. Or even, you know, if they, if they like, influence someone else or if they, you know, do one of these other things where they have outside knowledge or... Um, tell someone else like, Oh, it'd be really good if you did this, uh, you know, to find a way not to reward that behavior to, uh, kind of factor that into the fight. Um, as DM certainly control a lot in a battle and have the ability to do a lot. And sometimes the DM giveth and sometimes the DM taketh away. Yeah. And, uh, I certainly, you know, I usually try to make, mobs fight intelligently to the extent that they are intelligent you know Mm -hmm. if they have an intelligence of four they're just going to walk up and start biting you um yeah but if they're clever i usually try to make them clever but you know there are times when i might hold them back a little bit or something i go okay i want this to be a fun fight not like crazy um but (laughs) you know i can always dial it up i could always be like oh well if you're gonna do that then you're saying it's okay for the DM to metagame off of other people metagaming. <laughs> I don't, I yes. don't know if, <laughs> <metagaming>. <laughs> if yeah. the DM does it. Cause the DM is the metagame. The DM right. has all the I knowledge. am the meta. <laughs> I oh no, this monster the keeps attacking player <laughs> A only because my random rolls are randomly landing on player A. I would say more normally as a DM, if, if there are two people there, I would be like, oh, I'm going to, there's equal chances, neither one's hit it, so I'm going to roll randomly, decide who it hits. Uh, whereas if I, if you're metagaming or something, I may just be like, no, it hits you. <laughs> <laughs> it chooses you. It chooses you. I can't do that because I actually have a, a macro on roll 20 that randomly picks one of you. Uh, and I've noticed sometimes it picks someone more favorably, like consistently than the other, but... <laughs> Like Rohan, 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 Tully, Rohan, Rohan. <laughs> Stop hitting me! <laughs> I don't use it for every instance, but when I need it, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a pattern. It seems. Yeah. I do. I do like having people. Like if I want to pick a random target for something, I do like having people call their own doom and be like, "All right, pick a yeah. number. Evens or odds. Yeah. Roll the dice. All right, yep. you did this to yourself. It's not my fault. You did it to yourself." Fate is in your hands tonight. <laughs> um, so let's see. I, I, the, the last thing I have on that, which kind of goes more into dealing with metagaming um, and, and kind of transitions into that. How do you talk with someone when you need to talk to them about metagaming? And uh, I think it's important to have a good level of emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And it's important to know and consider when a conversation needs to be private. Um, You know, like there are some things like what you mentioned where 
okay, they, they in the moment they're doing something, you're like, wait, no, your character wouldn't know that. So you wouldn't know to do that. And I think that's, you know, that's fine. But then there are some instances where it's so egregious that you're like, no, we had to have, we have to have a conversation and it's not going to be one you have at the table with everybody. Right. It's going to be, it needs to be a one-on-one private conversation. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a DM, you, in that moment of that act that is so outrageously metagaming you, you still have to kind of stop it and be like, that's, I can't allow that. Like that. It just doesn't make any sense for what your character would do. Um, let's move on and we'll, we'll talk about it after and, you know, work it out. Yeah. I think it's, it's for more pervasive things. You know, if something is happening yeah. again and again, you're having to stop them for small things over and over again, or they're constantly like coaching other people out of character. Like, Hey, if you do this, blah, 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 you do that, blah, blah, blah. And so on and so forth. And they're not like a brand new player. Like I, I give some definite leeway for coaching brand new players. Like, no, for sure. Like help them learn the game. Um, but otherwise, outside of that, it, it starts to become pervasive, something that they're doing over and over and over again. You eventually do need to have, if it continues like that, after you've stopped them before, a, a private conversation to go, like, look, this is what I expect. And I think that's the the tone of the conversation is important in that case because I think mm-hmm. it's it's a good idea to go in uh, first and not be emotional. Um, uh, to sit down, kind of mention, hey, this is, you know, this is what you're doing that I don't, that I don't think is appropriate for the game. This is what my expectations are. We had the conversation at the beginning of the game about expectations. Um, this is what my expectations are for this behavior or, or this type, how the fights are going to go or so on and so forth. Uh, and this is why I think it's a problem. I think that's important because not everybody sees will necessarily see metagaming as a problem and necessarily see it and go like, well, I'm just I'm just trying to help them. I'm just trying to give them ideas on, on what to do for fights and stuff and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, explaining to someone like, well, that's kind of an it's an issue. One, because I want that person to feel like they're free to play their character to they're free to right. mess up. They're free to do things that aren't ideal. Um, we're not necessarily playing a game to be, you know, to be like power gamers and absolutely trounce every single contest. I want people to be able to, you know, to think that for themselves and do what they want. And so when you keep throwing out suggestions, it's problematic because that person may feel pressured to do what you want them to do instead of doing what they think would be fun to do. Right. Uh, you know, so just kind of explaining, you know, and of course the explanation will vary, but I think that's an important thing is explaining why it's a problem because uh, not everyone's necessarily going to come into the conversation knowing or agreeing why it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to RP in particular, uh, across the spectrum of the things you can role play in MMOs, tabletops, uh, metagaming is almost a universal standard of expectation that role players uh, have for how to address them. And just maybe someone really doesn't understand that. And, bringing that onto the table in that discussion is like, this is kind of what it means to do this. This is why people don't like it and really kind of enlighten them or educate them on what it means so that they hopefully understand it and actually start kind of following uh, and taking it in themselves. Yeah. And I liked something that you said earlier, uh, which is, um, you know, to deal with it when it's a small problem uh, and, and don't let it go on. Yeah. Uh, don't let it persist and just keep happening. You know, if you see some metagaming happening that you think is inappropriate, and again, we've kind of discussed that some of it, you know, you let slide, you just go like, whatever. It's, it's we're having fun. It doesn't matter. Um, but if there's something that you're like, you don't that you don't want to happen, call it when it happens, and you know, do it casually, and and just kind of like, hey, that, you know, you don't know to do that, so don't do that. Um, and then later on, if you do, if it keeps happening, you have to have a conversation. You go, you know, I've kind of stopped you from doing this before, but you don't want to wait and let it build and then suddenly try to have a conversation about it because then they're going to get defensive. They're going to be like, Very, what? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're probably already going to be defensive, but they're going to be really defensive if you're just out of left field. Suddenly, this is a problem. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, most of the people like in our group, we tend to do it sometimes. We are like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm not there you know, duh. 
<laughs> biggest metagaming pet peeve people having knowledge of a conversation that took place when they were not in the room <laughs> yeah my my biggest metagaming pet peeve is someone not paying attention and then jumping into a conversation when they're not there <laughs> <laughs> like like they're not paying attention at all they've been left behind or something and someone's gone off and they're like da 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 or doing something or talking and then someone's like hey blah 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 and i'm like you're not even there like <laughs> just back then, out of the room and then they ask the question oh wait like weren't we here like no we we've yeah. that was five minutes ago new location new it. scene <laughs> uh, which i think is definitely more of an online problem uh yeah than it is yeah in person problem Absolutely. when they're in person at the table they really have no choice but to pay attention uh, especially if you're like me like if i if i saw people playing on their phones the whole time in a, like a live game i would want to throw something at them i'd be like <laughs> so your metal d20 at them in the forehead <laughs> that, that's but, how uh, that's how i do meetings as well yeah. for work <laughs> if i'm there having to talk and not look at my phone y'all y'all can't look at your phones either um <laughs> uh, kind of on the topic i think the the main question that we last asked was what are ways to um i think like provide ways so that metagame isn't an issue I believe was the, it from being a problem. Okay, never mind. Then. I'll wait. <laughs> um, I mean, you could go ahead and jump into that. I was going to provide some tips, uh, but I think we've kind of gone through them all. Um, yeah, the only other tip I was going to add was that people should bear in mind when they, if they do have to have a conversation or deal with some metagaming, that it's rarely malicious. I don't think people are very yeah. often intentionally trying to metagame, except if someone's like cheating and looking up character monster stats or something. But, uh, you know, they're, people are just trying to have fun. They might be getting excited. They may, may be a little too excited. They may just not know what metagaming yeah. is. Or and that's probably that counts. largely the case is, is that they don't understand what it is and there was an expectation not set perhaps uh either individually or as a group that hey this this is a no thing we, we don't do this we try our best not to do this at least yeah so that was my last tip what did you what did you have you wanted well, to go we into? were talking about um <laughs> uh, online stuff uh and, and the virtual setting i've found personally is a great way to uh to deal with uh not necessarily preventing it but allowing uh information to spread without it uh, we talked about it briefly earlier touched upon being able to send a message on discord to someone privately um, mm -hmm. and to allow them the player to make a choice whether they wish to share it or not uh, i think that adds to the story i think it helps prevent other players from catching on to things and and reacting when they may not normally react uh, and i like that kind of dynamic element of I've yeah. done it with, with you, uh, with you DMing. I, I, I do things, I message you and vice versa. Uh, in my campaign, uh, frequently to all of you guys, you all get kind of private little things here and there, and I allow you to choose what to do with that information. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's something that's really good for most games, uh, whether D&D &D or otherwise, uh, is a, a kind of the private message or the whispers scenario where you're going in to <clears throat> give someone information just to their character and they get to choose what they want to tell to other people it does help to prevent metagaming but it also helps to uh you know really invest people and draw attention to something that's going on uh and then it gives someone kind of a a position of power to a certain extent where they yeah. have info no <laughs> one else has and it may relate to their character it may relate to someone else's character who knows and no one knows and that uh, draws attention yeah it's it can be super helpful even uh at the at the table setting the the whispers and whatnot you know watching critical role matt mercer is huge into his whispers um to the point where they even have an advertisement they they shoot out and they like all loudly just start talking so that they don't hear what's going on um so that the person can have the whisper and react to it if need be uh and that's helpful to allow the player to have that agency to give the other players info rather than hearing it from the DM and just knowing it universally. Let's see. 
Crim Slice told me on an old school occasion. We set up a real life banquet, bucket of chicken and drinks. The GM played a vengeful armored ogre king who was going to pick one of us to die after the feast. We were all groveling for our individual lives. I eventually tossed a pouch of gold coins behind him. He turned around, bit down to pick them up. Got in, leaned forward, mimic pouring a vial into his decanter. I was a thief. I had poison. <laughs> <laughs> he finished his decanter of beer. We have I informed of what I had done. He failed an insisted perception roll. Then he crit failed his health roll. He died. We looted him in the room and escaped out the window. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming. Uh, that that is an interesting scenario because you're actually playing it out. You're really LARPing at that point. Y'all were LARPing instead of really playing tabletop, um, which does add a very different dynamic to uh, metagaming because there are certain things that are, I mean, if you're LARPing it and you do it, I mean, <laughs> depending on the game, that kind of works. Um, uh, I've done some uh, kind of fantasy medieval enactment LARP stuff before and uh you know we had some games and things like that we would do uh, for instance there was a uh an event they would do during it was like a week-long camping event and there was an event they would do during it um i forget what they called it but basically it was an assassination competition people would uh, would sign up to be marks and other people who wanted to be assassins would sign up to be assassins and they were given um they basically were able to go around at any point. They would be assigned marks to kill and they could go around the camps at various points, find the person they were assigned to kill, sneak up on them and stab them and kill them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is LARP. So there weren't any dice involved or anything. It was just literally like, yeah, boosh, and you're like, ah, and then they run off and you're like, Oh, well, crap. Uh, but other people could kill them. Like your friends could go kill them in retaliation if they caught them or something. And uh, <laughs> but similar to that, they would be they would give them once they got enough kills, they'd get like a poison sticker um, that they could put onto something to poison it. And then if someone drank from it, they could kill their mark. And one year, someone was funny and he poisoned the well. He went and stuck it on the well for the campsite for the campground. <laughs> and no one noticed it till afterwards and then afterwards he was like i've killed everyone on this campground so i think i win <laughs> um that story not yours in this case but funny uh grim slags actually brings up an interesting point to metagaming um you know we, we talk about how the dm or the storyteller deals with metagaming and that the dm is the meta of gaming um but even even the dms can i think metagame to an extent how do you feel about a situation uh and i'm going to take from critical role specifically this if you recall uh not too long ago the cupcake incident mm -hmm. with in particular paired with the dust of deliciousness and a player doing something without actually saying they're doing something and then providing that something to the gm and mm -hmm seeing how that plays out. I will say, I, I, I thought it was good on him that he didn't call her on it. Because I don't think it's okay, generally, for a player to do something, not tell the DM about it, and then expect for it to go through. Because there are, you know, there are mechanics that you would use otherwise. Like, uh, if she went... For instance, if she went, I'm going to put this this dust on my cupcake and I'm going to give it to the person, I would have been like, okay, roll sleight of hands to put it on there without them seeing. Now, if you pass right. the sleight of hands, fair. But I would have been like, that's a skill. You have to do that. You have to roll that. You can't just pretend you did it and then after the fact be like, oh, by the way, I I, I rubbed some, some poison on your, on your cupcake. Like, that's not how that happens. Um, so I'm not very okay with that. It was a really awesome, epic moment. And I think, as Sarah said, rule of cool, it was good on him to go with it and to go, all right, this is too cool for me to mess up. Like, I'm just going to let it slide. Mm -hmm. But no, in general, I, I wouldn't want to let let that fly. Um, I, would, I would just deal with it after the fact, like, or not after the fact, but, you know, if she was like, I put 
dust deliciousness on there, I would have been like, okay, make a sleight of hands check. But she already ate it. No, make a sleight of hands check now because I would have asked you for that if you told me you were doing it. Yeah. Um, but in the in the situation, like you know, I I do believe that when possible, invoking the rule of cool is a good idea. Um, it's it's good for player fun and enjoyment of stuff. So I don't know if I would have necessarily called her on it directly or if I would have let it slide as well. Uh, but as general practice, I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I caught it as it was happening in this instance. And for what we're talking about, without going into it, for those of you who haven't seen it, spoilers, uh, a player uh, did a thing and retroactively decided something else was happening uh, and to, to come up with an effect, kind of in a way almost – out of character, out of character, wise, strategically trying to do something, and and pushing it forward, and then walking back on it so that it would, you know, catch the DM off guard. Yeah, uh, they were intentionally trying to kind of trick the DM into it. Yeah, but I, I do, I do think fully think she intended to do it and was like, yeah. "This is a thing. I'm just not telling the DM that I'm doing it." Yeah. Oh, by the way, I did that, and then you're like. Yeah, it's, it's one thing for the DM to withhold information or share it or distribute it to certain players. It's kind of another thing for a player to withhold the, what they're doing from the DM. Yeah. The whole role of the DM is is to judge and to make a rule uh, to say yes or no to this and that based off what's happening. Yeah, It's hard um, to inform the progression of story when the DM is not informed by what the players are actually doing. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you could make arguments that since it was in a bag that it was happening, perhaps you should have advantage on that. You know, um, I would think that would be fair, but still there's a role involved. I mean, the person sitting right there looking at you, getting the cupcake out <laughs> and now you're going to poison it. It's like, but it's a, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting point to bring up, you know, of what is okay because, you know, to a certain extent, I guess in some ways the DM, the DM can metagame themselves as well. Um, uh, I'm certainly, you know, as a DM, I try not to be invested in things that I want to happen too much. You know, I try to let the players decide what's going to happen, but when you spend a lot of time building something, you can't help but be a little bit invested in it. Uh, so, you're certainly going to have some desires about how something goes down um, at the very least to the point of wanting it to be like a challenge or wanting it to be interesting. And then if players completely trounce it, you're like, mm, no, <laughs> um, I've certainly had to fight that compulsion before. Like, I don't want this to be over. <laughs> oh, okay. It's fine. It's fine. Let it go. Let it go. It's fine. Just let it go. <laughs> as he skulks around the house because we didn't go after the dragonborn <laughs> no that that that's because y'all left the entire city i had built <laughs> i'm gonna build this entire settlement this entire uh this entire city with npcs and content and everything that y'all have been working towards for a while and up oh, you just left you just you got there and you left. You, s you, you gave us quests to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, we didn't have the money to really do most of them, but <laughs> also gave you quests to stay. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I tried to do it. I didn't. I never figured y'all were gonna stay there very long. I was just like, yeah. more than a night. A lot of work goes into it. I thought to, more than a to night to spend two hours there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's just like okay, bye. Get we'll me. be back. All right. We'll be back. All right. And the work will um, be done. But it's tough. You know, as the as the DM, you try not to be too invested in things you want to happen. Uh, and then people throw a wrench in it, and you have to be like, it's okay. <laughs> Deep breaths. It's okay. Yeah. So I do think that the, the DM can metagame and kind of mess with things a little bit. But in certain circumstances, uh, that might happen. Um, let's see here. One thing I, I did want to bring up is what we've kind of discussed this a little bit, but what things you let slide the most? Um, I think for me, it's probably out of character suggestions and chatter. 
I generally yeah. don't s- say anything about them unless like, or like I've never really had to say anything about them, and I don't think I would unless it was really pervasive, like happening a lot. Yeah, I, I yeah the small things. Um, I think we're we're also really good about being aware of of what we're doing or reacting to um, that most things pass because they're not actually medicating for us. Um, so it's it's the small things that just are okay that get by sometimes. Well, that's pretty much it for the things I wanted to ask. Did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Uh, kind of along the, the case of, like, we talked about the monster manual uh, mm-hmm. and, like, knowing the monsters. A lot of people know the monsters, especially if you play a lot. Players and DMs know the monsters because the players kill the monsters, the DMs send the monsters after them. Uh, but there are a lot of modules and a lot of lore books and just world mm. knowledge out there that the same principle kind of applies to that, that you might just be an avid reader of the mythos of Dungeons and Dragons and the Forgotten Realms or whatever, uh, or Vampire the Masquerade, anything. Uh, how do you feel, I guess, about players who have gone through a lot of those more dedicated specific modules or lore books or uh, very fine-tuned details and, and walking into a game that you're running being like a really veteran player not just from playing but from understanding of those kind of predefined modules uh, i will say one thing i i don't read a lot of additional like setting guides and stuff um like unless i'm gonna play it specifically i i don't go out and read them i do read some of the monsters and stuff because IDM. So I do go and read some of those. Um, and that could be a thing. Uh, if I'm going to play one, I will go and read it. Uh, I will go read like the entire book. And that's both good in some ways because I can really build something tailored towards the setting. Uh, it's also could be bad because I can read and know about stuff. And, you know, I, we kind of talked about this in the last episode a little bit in how like my game's taking place in Eberron. I'm like, on the one hand, I want people to read some of the book so that they Mm -hmm. know some of the existing lore and stuff. On the other hand, I'm like, I don't necessarily want them to know things that I might, some things I might use. Um, And that could be, that could be problematic Uh, for me. It kind of goes down to like the, you know, the thing we were talking about earlier with like the shadow and the Mm -hmm. the mob stats and stuff. I pretend not to know. Uh, if something comes up and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know what that is uh, or what's going on. I just try to pretend not to know. And uh, honestly, I think I get most of my enjoyment from playing uh, by my own character's individual story and their interactions with other people anyway. So if things come up that I'm like, Oh, this is going to be a story about where we're going up against Tiamat or something. Eh, it's nice to be surprised. It's nice to have those story elements come out, and that's always fun. But it's not necessarily like the the primary driver, I think. Right. For me. Do you feel like it's okay knowing like you started Eberron and you going into that in a different way? You didn't do it with us, but do you feel it's okay as a DM to ask your players specifically, "Don't read this stuff. Let me yeah. give you an amount of information at the beginning of it. That's what you know." please don't go read these books. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say that's fine, especially because like you really have to do that with some other games like Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, there are some things that I would not want players to read uh, if I were, if I were play, if I were running the games. Um, and I've had that before where like, Oh, we're running this game. And someone's like, Oh, well I'm going to go read the clan book for this clan. But I'm like, mm, maybe don't. Because I might not use some of that, okay? <laughs> and they're going to come in with these expectations for how things work, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not. Uh, or I might want to surprise with something, and then they're like, oh, yeah, of course, I read about that. And I'm like, ah. So I totally think it's fine for if, if you have a reason to, to be like, don't go read that. Sensible, yeah. Uh, now, not just a – I don't think it's okay to do it, like, as a blanket thing. Like, don't go read the Eberron book at all, but maybe be like, okay – read this chapter and this chapter and this chapter or something, try to leave off the rest of it. Like don't really go into it. Cause I want some things to be surprises or, you know, I may not use some stuff. That makes sense. I will say, um, for Grimslag's comment, I try not to 
I can't say I'm always successful, but I try not to steer the group overtly. Uh, so I would, I would really never, like, if they left the town, I would really never have, like, a prophet sit there and be like, you have destiny, you must go back to the town <laughs> uh, and do stuff. I, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, I just I just sulk around the house. But they didn't like my yeah. town. They left it. I spent that's a it. week on that town. Mm. <laughs> that's what we call railroading. There's gr- grumble about it walking around yeah. the house. Um, I try to give but, incentive. I, w- I will try to put build in some incentives or some reasons to go to the town or something. Sure. Um, I just try to keep it. You you guide through those street. incentives through through. <laughs> through trying to hook a player's interest uh, or a character's interest, uh, more character's interest um, in, the, in the world of role-playing, at least, uh, just get them interested and curious to go to a place on their own through how meaningful that thing is to them. It's like, a, uh, that's almost like a, a DM version of metagaming if you're trying to force yeah. them to go somewhere or or really direct them with, with lore and stuff. You're like, I know there's things for you to do there. Go to this place. <laughs> I, I know what your character likes and dislikes. I'm putting this here specifically for you. <laughs> <laughs> now that, that is a thing every DM does. <laughs> yeah. That is a type of metagaming every DM does. I know what your character likes and I'm putting a thing here for you. There you go. Um, I think that really comes up sometimes with um, like quest rewards and stuff too and, mm-hmm. and loot. I'll sometimes give people loot they're not really going to use or might not be useful but if I'm like, I'm usually, if sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm like, I really want to give them a magical weapon. Let's see. What weapons do they use? Or in like my game, why does everyone use a freaking rapier? Oh my God. <laughs> right. <laughs> use a different I, weapon. I, I like the uh, walks into a magical shop that sells magical items. Do you have a hat of disguise? It's like, uh, uh, do you know what that is? No. <laughs> well, technically, I think my character actually requested a hat that would disguise. No, no. Yeah, me. <laughs> you, you you specifically laid out the criteria. You were looking for a hat that did this thing. Does it exist? Some other people. Do you have a hat of disguise? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, do you have some kind of clothing item, like a hat, perhaps, that would <laughs> allow me to change my appearance? <laughs> circumventing without really circumventing. Well, because I was like, that's a thing he wants. Like, that seems like a thing he would want. Let's go. Yeah. He knows it's a spell, at least. It could be <laughs> a ring. It could spell. be a shirt. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what it is exactly. All right. Well, I think that is pretty much everything at this point. Um, thanks, everybody, for yeah. hanging out and talking about metagaming with us in its various chimeric like uh, forms. Um, as a reminder, we have a lot of different things coming on on this channel on Friday. I have Friday night streams, um, every Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, eventually, probably not this Friday, but the next Friday, those will go back to being a VR gaming stream because I'll finally have, uh, all my stuff set up and everything, uh, uh, I do Sunday afternoons. I do some Star Citizen live streams. Uh, those will... I still haven't set a time for those because I have to move them now that I'm Pacific Time. 1 p.m. TBD. really does not work anymore. TBD. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you follow the channel, you will get notifications of when things like that and when this show, Mass and Mimicry, which airs every other Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, goes also, live. Also, uh, Camelot Unchained. Once a month. Camel on Chain, once a month, first Sunday of the month. Uh, our next topic for this show is going to be dealing with death in the party. Yes. Uh, storyteller, how do you deal with when one of your players dies? Or vice versa. And so, that is a pl- we will hopefully see you when we're talking about that in two weeks. Until then, remember, if it's a note from the DM... Probably not a mimic.